Day 254 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, guess what? We are finishing up another book today. We're finishing the book of Ezekiel. I know some of y'all are like, oh, thank God, <laughs> because this is one of the more difficult books of the Bible to get through, especially uh, as far as prophecy goes. And so we did it. We're doing it together. So be on the lookout for our little graphic, our social media graphic, where you can check off the box. Hopefully, I'm not putting too much pressure on Holly right now to release that. She typically gives those out in the emails. And if you're like, what are you talking about emails? Well, if you are new here and you haven't heard about it, we do have a daily email that goes out. There is a link to sign up for the newsletter in the description box. And speaking of the description box, there's a lot of info in there, including our brand new affiliate link for the logo software. So if you have been considering purchasing the logo software, we do have a special discount for anybody who wants to use our link. I believe we're going to be doing a webinar soon on the logo software. We're really excited about it. Do you guys say logos or logos? The logos people say logos. I used to only say logos. Actually, I think I say both now. Anyway, we've got a link to our new merchandise shop. We've got the link to my notes for today's reading a link to our prayer room on Monday, link to our website, link to my Amazon link where all my favorite Bible study supplies and commentaries and books and Bibles are in there. So make sure to check that out. If you are a part of the Heart Dive family and you know all this stuff already, could you hit the roll call button, the thumbs up button so that we can continue to create content and build out this ministry and spread God's word and bring him glory all over the earth. So we're going to start now here in Ezekiel chapter 46, running through the end of the book, chapter 48, reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. But before we start, as always, let's go ahead and pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We know a lot of us are remembering this day, September 11th, 9-11, as a grave and horrific day. So we honor those lives that were lost on that day. We never want to forget their memory. And so we just honor them now. And thank you, Lord, for their families who probably are continuing to mourn this day. But we also want to thank you, Lord, for every single service member. Lord, whether people are a part of the police department, the fire department, first responders, those who live their lives out to serve their community, those in the military. We thank you, Lord, for their sacrifice that they give every single day, just for that heart of service to want to be able to help others. I pray that they are blessed today, Lord. Let them know how loved they are and how appreciated they are by us. I know we've got some here in our group, Lord, so I pray that they're hearing these words right now and that their cup is filled up just a little bit more. And as we do remember tragedies like this, I pray that we will be able to see you in it, Lord, and help us to continue to grow in our forgiveness and our grace and our mercy, but also just to remind never to take any day for granted, never to take any minute for granted, any breath for granted, for all of it is precious and it is determined by you. And so we're just grateful, Lord, that we are still here. We know we've got work to do. So please forgive us now for our sins. And we just ask, Lord, that you will cleanse our hearts, purify us so that we are ready to receive your word. Everything that we read today, oh Lord, make it make sense. Help us to be able to read it with understanding, to receive knowledge and wisdom and discernment. I pray that you will grow us, Lord, from glory to glory in our relationship with you, even when we don't fully grasp the word, Lord, just speak to us in a sweet, simple way. Thank you for keeping us faithful on this path and for always being there every time we show up. We love you so much. Lord, hide me behind the cross right now so only you are seen in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday we talked about the holy district and all of the areas that were marked out. And so now we're taking a look at some of the feasts and the things that are going to go on in the temple, starting off here in chapter 46, verse one. Thus says the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut on the six working days, but on the Sabbath day, it shall be opened. And on the day of the new moon, it shall be opened. The people of the land shall bow down at the entrance of the gate before the Lord on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. So some might be asking, is this that same gate that was shut up before? Well, I believe it is, and it was opened up whenever Jesus returns, and now it is to remain shut except for this specific day, this Sabbath day. So we got to remember, this is a Jewish setting now. We got to remember the original audience. So when we're talking about Sabbaths and new moons, this doesn't apply to us in this very day. This was speaking to the people then about their future in the millennial kingdom. Verse four, the burnt offering that the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. You know, if we are going to be legalistic about the Sabbath day today, then we're going to have to be legalistic about all of it and be bringing these sacrifices. Okay, so 
So this is why as Christians, we're not legalistic about it. I mean, I take a Sabbath, I honor it, I believe in it in taking a day of rest. But as far as what the Sabbath day was in the Old Testament, we're not held to those standards anymore, okay? So I just wanna make that clear. At least that's where I stand on the on the matter. But I do believe in a day of rest. And the grain offering with the ram shall be an ephah, and the grain offering with the lambs shall be as much as he is able, together with a hin of oil to each ephah. Here we go again with those hins and ephahs. On the day of the new moon, he shall offer a bull from the herd without blemish, and six lambs and a ram which shall be without blemish. As a grain offering, he shall provide an ephah with the bull and an ephah with the ram and with the lambs as much as he is able, together with a hin of oil to each ephah. When the prince enters, he shall enter by the vestibule of the gate and he shall go out by the same way. So wherever the prince enters is the same way that the prince goes out. It's important to note that because we're going to see the difference between the prince and the people in the way that they enter and exit. Verse nine, when the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed feast, he who enters by the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate, and he who enters by the south gate shall go out by the north gate. No one shall return by way of the gate by which he entered, but each shall go out straight ahead. When they enter, the prince shall enter with them, and when they go out, he shall go out. So in the millennial kingdom, there are going to be huge crowds, you know, gathering for worship, which is why we see the Lord probably establishing order here. You're going to come in one way and you're going to leave in another. But if you say that out loud and you listen to the spiritual implication of it, you know, when you come in to worship the Lord, you will come in one way and you will leave another. So in other words, when we worship, we should be leaving different from the way that we came in. You know, whether we are singing praises or we are praying or we are reading his word or we're just bringing him glory in our chores every single day, he will change us from glory to glory if we allow him to. Even in reading about temples and ephahs and hymns, sacrifices without blemish, if we don't just shut the book all frustrated halfway into the first sentence because it's boring, and if we allow him to, the Lord will work on our hearts, you know, even in the smallest of ways. For example, reading about these things does seem repetitive and it can even feel really daunting, but look at what's happening. We're showing up anyway. You know, we're learning discipline, we're learning faithfulness, and we're even being stretched in our knowledge and in, in our understanding. It's like every time you read this, a little bit more will start to make sense. You know, you'll start to see something a little bit better. And so we are being changed. If not, you might need to do a heart check. So when you come to worship, do you come in one way and leave another? Do you see how the Lord is changing you from glory to glory? Or is there something, whether it's an attitude or a sin, that is causing you to resist this change? Verse 11, at the feast and the appointed festivals, the grain offering with a young bull shall be an ephah, and with a ram an ephah, and with the lambs as much as one is able to give, together with a hint of oil to an ephah. When the prince provides a freewill offering, either a burnt offering or peace offerings as a freewill offering to the Lord, the gate facing east shall be opened for him, and he shall offer his burnt offering or his peace offerings as he does on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he has gone out, the gate shall be shut. So remember yesterday when we were talking about who is this prince? Is it Jesus himself? Is it David? Is it one of the Zadokite priests? We don't really know because the Bible doesn't name who it is. If it is Jesus, that's pretty amazing that he is going out to be among his people, that he is offering these sin offerings, not because he needs to, because he's still without sin, but perhaps because he is showing the weight of what his sacrifice actually meant. He is doing the things that he has called us to do. Because remember we said, he is not going to call us to do something that he wouldn't do himself, right? I mean, but he already did become the sacrifice. So we don't need to expect him to come and bring sacrifices. But if it is him, then he's doing it with the people. He's worshiping right alongside of them, the same way that he does with us. When we worship our Heavenly Father, Jesus is right there beside us worshiping. So we'll find out one day who this is, but it's good to consider both sides. Verse 13, you shall provide a lamb a year old without blemish for a burnt offering to the Lord daily. 
Morning by morning you shall provide it, and you shall provide a grain offering with it morning by morning, one sixth of an ephah and one third of a hin of oil to moisten the flour as a grain offering to the Lord. So remember that morning by morning phrase. You could look at this spiritually and say, well, this of course is speaking of our daily offering and our coming to Him morning by morning. This is a perpetual statute, meaning it's going to last all throughout the millennium. Thus the lamb and the meal offering and the oil shall be provided morning morning by morning for a regular burnt offering. Thus says the Lord God, if the prince makes a gift to any of his sons as his inheritance, and so here's another argument as to why this is not Jesus, because they say, well, he doesn't have any children. So again, we don't know. It shall belong to his sons, because other people say, no, we're speaking spiritually. Guys, I don't know. If you want to bring an argument or, no, let's not say argument. If you want to bring affirmation or you want to encourage us with what you believe to be as truth in this matter, please let us know in the comments, but please do so with love. Okay, it is their property by inheritance. But if he makes a gift out of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his to the year of liberty. So that's the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, the land gets given back to the rightful owner. Then it shall revert to the prince. Surely it is his inheritance. It shall belong to his sons. The prince shall not take any of the inheritance of the people thrusting them out of their property, he shall give his sons their inheritance out of his own property, so that none of my people shall be scattered from his property. Verse 19, then he brought me through the entrance, which was at the side of the gate to the north row of the holy chambers for the priests. And behold, a place was there at the extreme western end of them. And he said to me, this is the place where the priests shall boil the guilt offering and the sin offering and where they shall bake the grain offering in order not to bring them out into the outer court and so transmit holiness to the people. Then he brought me out to the outer court and led me around to the four corners of the court and behold, in each corner of the court, there was another court. In the four corners of the court were small courts, 40 cubits long and 30 broad. The four were of the same size. On the inside, around each of the four courts was a row of masonry with hearths made at the bottom of the rows all around. Then he said to me, these are the kitchens where those who minister at the temple shall boil the sacrifices of the people. Okay, so again, what is the purpose of all of this stuff? It is to show us this is going to be a very real thing with very real people and very real places with very real measurements. This is a God guidebook for the people to use in the millennial kingdom. So in the end, we see that the millennial kingdom is not just people sitting on a beach somewhere sipping pina coladas. Virgin, of course. Although I'm sure there will be people sitting on a beach somewhere sipping pina coladas. But right here we see, especially in Jerusalem or in the center of worship, there's still work to do and there's still worship. And if you think about that and it disappoints you, then we've got to come back to remembering that if we are going to claim the name servants of Christ, but then we get upset when whenever worship doesn't serve us, then we really aren't truly servants. For example, if you get upset whenever you go to church and the worship team picked bad songs on a weekend, or maybe if you don't get goosebumps or that feel good feeling, you know, when you walk out of church, or maybe even if you get constantly annoyed when we've got to read three pages of the Bible today, <laughs> then there might be a good chance that you are looking for God to serve you. And that is what we know to be selfish worship. You know, it's easy to fall into it. So I'm not judging anybody, especially whenever you do get into a routine of reading or even going to church, the newness of it wears off at some point. And it is easy to fall into the trap of monotony. And so then how do we avoid that? Well, for one, if you truly fear the Lord, and if you have that perfect reverence, it's impossible to do. You know, it's impo it's impossible to fall into that trap, but we are imperfect. So, we have to choose to battle our flesh and it starts in our minds. It starts with a mindset. So, for example, yesterday whenever I started reading this chapter, I thought to myself, "Okay, another reading of the temple. I'm probably not going to get any heart checks today." And I got sat down real quick whether it was the Holy Spirit or my own voice, but I clearly heard, you better change your attitude. And that was one tiny encounter, but it was all I needed 
because I could have easily walked away from reading this chapter here and say, gosh, I didn't get anything out of that. Yet here we are at our second heart check. So here we go. How selfish is your worship? Are you looking for it to do something for you? Or are you worshiping because you truly desire to serve Jesus? So my advice, if you ever feel that way, is just keep showing up. Just keep being faithful because the Lord will meet you. I promise you. I promise you because He promises you. Okay, moving into chapter 47, which is now telling the people there's a better day coming, guys. I love this chapter. It's very similar to Revelation 22, verse 1. Then He brought me back to the door of the temple. And who is this guy that's bringing him all over the place? We don't really know. Remember we were saying there was a man, not sure who the man is. But somebody's guiding him around, could be the Holy Spirit, could be Jesus, not sure. So then he brought me back to the temple and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced the east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Okay, I'm going to show you one of my wonky drawings again. Please don't copy this because it's not exact, but I wanted to be able to get a visual. So if we have the Mediterranean Sea here, and this is the promised land, I wrote a big O temple here because again, it's not to scale, but we will see here at the south side of the temple, this river that flows, and we're going to see it flows into the Dead Sea and also flows westward into the Mediterranean Sea. So that's the visual first before we continue on. Verse two, then he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side and going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand. The man measured a thousand cubits, which is roughly a third of a mile, and then led me through the water and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand and it led me through the water and it was waist deep. So here we see him walking into this river and it's just getting deeper and deeper and deeper as he goes. And again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed through, meaning it was a powerful river, a rushing river. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? So in other words, I need you to carefully think about this. Okay, so when we carefully think about this, there has never been a river in Jerusalem like this. There were streams and there were probably brooks, but nothing of this size and nothing of this force. And historically, Jerusalem really is one of the only cities in this time that was not built around a body of water. So this river may possibly form whenever Jesus returns, steps foot on the Mount of Olives. And this is according to Zechariah 14. And it says that there's going to be an earthquake and the mountain is literally going to split into two. And when you look at my wonky drawing here, the Mount of Olives right here in front of the temple at the base of on the north side of that river. And so with all of those topographical changes of an earthquake, it makes sense that that is where that great river will be formed. Now, I don't know. This is just speculative, but it makes sense, right? So this river is not only going to be a miracle, but it is also going to be a blessing because it's going to bring life, it's going to bring refreshment, it's going to bring hope, it's going to bring security to the region, just as His living water does for us. So we can look at this river spiritually. And I think about the trip that I just recently took to Zion National Park, where we hiked a hike called the Narrows. It's one of their more popular hikes. And before you even get to water, you have to hike an entire mile. And we were hiking in summer, so it was like 100 degrees. And so whenever you step foot into the Virgin River, it feels so good. It is so refreshing. This is at ankle deep water. And so this is, spiritually speaking, that beautiful moment of salvation, you know, where you just want to keep growing. So you keep on walking. And then eventually the water gets to your knees. And then you kind of start to feel the power of the river. It doesn't look like it's flowing so fast, but it is. And you may even get a little bit wobbly at that point. My husband did. I was like his assistant at this point. And so when we think about it spiritually, this is where you start to grow in your prayer life, where you're down on your knees. This is where you're starting to fellowship with the Lord. This is where you're recognizing that you cannot do this life without Him and that you need need his assistance. But then you keep walking 
until you're finally waist deep. Okay, and so this is where it starts to get a little bit uncomfortable, you know? This is where that cold water hits your midsection and hits your backside, but it's also kind of exciting, you know? And this is where you start reading the Word of God, and it hits in a way that is so uncomfortable, but it begins to purify you, and it gets you excited again. And so now you're kind of at this crossroads, you know, when you're waist deep in cold water, you know whenever you've ever swam in cold water, you have a choice to either remain in this uncomfortable position or you're going to just immerse yourself. You're going to dive in. Anybody who's been here knows it is better to just go for it. It's like ripping the bandaid off. Just go under. So that is when you experience that beautiful refreshing of being immersed. And it's the same way that when you finally allow yourself to just swim with the current rather than fight against it, it's one of the most freeing things that you can ever experience in your relationship with Christ. And see, the interesting thing about the narrows is the further in you go, the more beautiful it gets and the less people there are. So in a spiritual sense, it's kind of a sad thing. You know, there are masses right at the beginning of that hike. Everybody kind of sitting ankle deep in the pews of the church, but they never go beyond that. So heart check. How deep into the water are you? What can you do to grow deeper? Now, if you are here on day 254 and you have been here since day one, you are probably pretty immersed by now, I would imagine. And no place in the journey is better than another. Where God has you is exactly where He has you, and it's exactly where He's meeting you. So I don't want anybody to feel like because they are just here on day 254, but they're just starting, that you're somehow less than. You are not. You've been chosen to be here on this very day, watching this very video for a purpose. God knows. I don't know. But if you just allow yourself to be open and just allow His living water, His Spirit to wash over you, you're going to know. You're going to experience something that nothing on this earth could offer. So hang in there. You're right where you're supposed to be. Okay. Okay. So we're continuing here at the end of verse six. Then he led me back to the bank of the river. And as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river, very many trees on the one side and on the other side. So here's my wonky trees on the sides of the river. And these trees, if you want to look at them spiritually, it could represent the wilderness. It could represent the many people in the kingdom. I don't really know. I kind of just wrote the wilderness because it makes sense. Like when you immerse yourself into your relationship with God, I mean, it's inevitable that you end up back in the wilderness for some reason or another, because life has its ups and downs, right? And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, this meaning the Dead Sea, and enters the sea. And when the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. So again, his water is living water, the Dead Sea dead. So now when the living water flows into the Dead Sea, which right now is about 25% salt or saline, which is why you can float in it without even trying to swim, and nothing can survive there, but when this river flows into it, things will come to life again. There's going to be life in the Dead Sea. And this just gets me so excited because I feel like that's exactly how he is with us. He brings things to life again. Oh my gosh. Okay, verse nine. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live and there will be very many fish. So you can look at this as the fact that we are fishers of men and wherever the spirit goes, there are going to be more fish that come into the net. So walk with the spirit, be a fisher of men. You are a huge part of this for this water goes there that the waters of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Gosh, I love that. Come alive in the river. So fishermen will stand beside the sea. From En Gedi to Enigleum, it will be a place for the spreading of the nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. What's the significance of leaving some of it for salt? I underlined it and meant to go back to it, but... We've done quite a few talking about salt and the significance of it. The salt being a preservative, it's a healing agent. It is symbolic of the permanence of the covenant that God makes with his people. But I didn't go back to it in this instance. So if anybody has got anything on that, verse 11, let me know. We continue in verse 12. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows 
flows into the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. So there's going to be year round fruit on these trees. Hallelujah. And their leaves will be healing leaves. So everything is kind of being restored back to the way it was supposed to be, say in the garden of Eden. Now we move into the division of the land. And this is a real division of the land that is going to take place. The promised land will be divided. It will have very real borders, even though it's hard for us to know exactly where these borders are, because some of these places are unknown. We can get kind of a decent idea. And I do have an image that I put in the description box in a link where you can print this version out. This is from the ESV by Crossway Bible. I actually gave you the link for the Blue Letter Bible, which is another really great resource that you can use for Bible study. But I just printed mine out again on tracing paper, glued it into my Bible. I love that it's huge and I can see everything. And it has a much better sketch of my sketch yesterday. It's probably a bit more accurate. Actually, I was like, I didn't do that bad of a job. It's kind of similar, but you can print that out if you want to. So here we go. Thus says the Lord God, this is the boundary by which you shall divide the land for inheritance among the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. Why? Because remember, he has his two sons. It was the half tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. And you shall divide equally what I swore to give to your fathers. This land shall fall to you as your inheritance. So God is all about equality of the inheritance here. This shall be the boundary of the land on the north side from the Great Sea. So this is the Mediterranean Sea. And we're just going to run here so you can get a visual. This red line here is the boundary line of the land. So it runs all the way from the Mediterranean Sea sea over to Zedad. It runs a bit southwest and down to the Dead Sea and then back out to the Brook of Egypt and into the Med Sea again. So as we read, you can kind of envision this a little bit, hopefully. This shall be the boundary of the land on the north side from the Great Sea by way of Hethlon to Lebo Hamath and on to Zedad. Berotha, Sibram, which lies on the border between Damascus and Hamath, as far as Hazar Hadakon, which is on the border of Haran. So the boundary shall run from the sea to Hazar Enon, which is on the northern border of Damascus with the border of Hamath to the north. And this shall be the north side. So aka this red line right here, from the Med Sea to Zedad. Okay. On the east side, the boundary shall run between Hauran and Damascus along the Jordan between Gilead and the land of Israel to the eastern sea and as far as Tamar. And this shall be the east side. So from Zedad down to Tamar. On the south side, it shall run from Tamar as far as the waters of Meribah Kadesh from there along the brook of Egypt to the Great Sea. And this shall be the south side. So as we took a look here earlier. And on the west side, the Great Sea shall be the boundary to a point opposite Lebo Hamath, and this shall be the west side. So where the south met the Mediterranean Sea goes all the way back up to the point where we started. Now, notice here that the Jordan River is right here, and none of the boundary line extends to the east where Reuben Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh claimed land. So it's going back to the original promised land on the west side of it. Verse 21, so you shall divide this land among you according to the tribes of Israel. You shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the sojourners who reside among you and have had children among you. They shall be to you as native born children of Israel. With you, they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the sojourner resides, there you shall assign him his inheritance, declares the Lord God. Now, I honestly want to look more into this because I rose the question, how are the people of Israel today, like, does their ancestry go so far back that they know which tribe they came from? I know we've got some people from Israel in this Bible study. Can you let us know, or if anybody knows this information, because I do want to do a deeper dive study on this, but how will the people of Israel in the end times know which tribe they are in? Or is this something that Jesus just tells them? I don't know. I am not an expert on eschatology end times. I mean, I'm just barely scratching the surface here with this Bible study. So it is something I do want to study more in the future. But for now, we move into chapter 48. These are the names of the tribes, beginning at the northern extreme, beside the way of Hethlon to Lebo Hamath, as far as Hazar Enan, which is on the northern border of Damascus over against Hamath and extending from the east side to the west, Dan. 
Dan, one portion. So we are going to see here on this same map, all of the tribes getting their equal portions of the land. And so again, giving you a visual of what we're reading here. And what's interesting here is whenever we read in Revelation chapter seven, Dan is actually not even mentioned at all. And the explanation behind that is because Dan was the first tribe to fall into idolatry. But the beautiful thing here is seeing that Dan is not only mentioned, it is mentioned first, which to me shows the grace, the mercy, and the restoration of our God and how close that is to his heart, which when we take it even further, tells me that no matter how badly you have messed things up, no matter what you have done in your life, you are not kicked to the back of the line here. I mean, God is going to restore those who seek after him with that sincerity. That same grace and mercy that he extends to the tribe of Dan extends to us. And he will lift us up to a place of prominence. He will put you at the front of the line if he sees fit. So never count yourself out. God can do anything. He did it with me. Not saying I'm at the front of the line, but he definitely took me from the back of the line <laughs> where I deserve to be. Verse eight, adjoining the territory of Judah from the east side to the west shall be the portion which you shall set apart 25,000 cubits in breadth and in length equal to one of the tribal portions from the east side to the west with the sanctuary in the midst of it. The portion that you shall set apart for the Lord shall be 25,000 cubits in length and 20,000 in breadth. These shall be the allotments of the holy portion. The priest shall have an allotment measuring 25,000 cubits on the northern side, 10,000 cubits in breadth on the western side, 10,000 in breadth on the eastern side, and 25,000 in length on the southern side, with the sanctuary of the Lord in the midst of it. This shall be for the consecrated priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept my charge, who did not go astray when the people of Israel went astray, as the Levites did. And it shall belong to them as a special portion from the holy portion of the land, a most holy place adjoining the territory of the Levites. And alongside the territory of the priests, the Levites shall have an allotment of 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in breadth. The whole length shall be 25,000 cubits and the breadth 20,000. They shall not sell or exchange any of it. They shall not alienate this choice portion of the land for it is holy to the Lord. So this is what we read about yesterday. Bit of a repeat here on some of those parameters. Verse 15, the remainder 5,000 cubits in breadth and 25,000 in length shall be for common use for the city, for dwellings and for open country. In the midst of it shall be the city and these shall be its measurements. The north side, 4,500 cubits, the south side, 4,500, the east side, 4,500 and the west side, 4,500. And the city shall have open land on the north, 250 cubits on the south, 250 on the east, 250 and on the west, 250. The remainder of the length alongside the holy portion shall be 10,000 cubits to the east and 10,000 cubits to the west, and it shall be alongside the holy portion. Its produce shall be for food for the workers of the city, and the workers of the city from all the tribes of Israel shall till it. The whole portion that you shall set apart shall be 25,000 cubits square, that is, the holy portion together with the property of the city." What remains on both sides of the holy portion and of the property of the city shall belong to the prince, extending from the 25,000 cubits of the holy portion to the east border, and westward from the 25,000 cubits to the west border, parallel to the tribal portions. It shall belong to the prince. The holy portion with the sanctuary of the temple shall be in its midst. It shall be separate from the property of the Levites and the property of the city, which are in the midst of that which belongs to the prince. The portion of the prince shall lie between the territory of Judah and the territory of Benjamin. So there we see where the holy portion is between Judah, between Benjamin, right here in this tiny rectangle, and we see it zoomed in here. In this diagram. As for the rest of the tribes from the east side to the west, Benjamin one portion, adjoining the territory of Benjamin from the east side to the west, Simeon one portion, adjoining the territory of Simeon from the east side to the west, Issachar one portion, adjoining the territory of Issachar from the east side to the west, Zebulun one portion, and adjoining the territory of Zebulun from the east side to the west, Gad one portion, and adjoining the territory of Gad to the south, the boundary shall run from Tamar to waters of Meribah Kadesh, from there along the brook of Egypt to the great sea. This is the land that you shall allot as an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. And these are their portions declares the Lord God. Alrighty. So all 12 tribes, 12 tribes, 
12 tribes back in the promised land where they belong. Now we move into the new city. This is the new Jerusalem that God will be building, meaning a brand new era for the people. Verse 30, these shall be the exits of the city. On the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, and the gate of Levi, the gates of the city being named after the tribes of Israel. On the east side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Joseph, the gates of Benjamin, and the gate of Dan. On the south side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Issachar, and the gate of Zebulun. Isn't this sweet? It's like everybody gets a gate. On the west side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Gad, the gate of Asher, and the gate of Naphtali. The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that time on shall be, the Lord is there. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. I mean, what an amazing way to end the book of Ezekiel. Started out with his holiness, explaining what his holiness is, the importance of it, why the people are being judged, all of the prophecies that are being spoken, so much darkness, so much heaviness, so much repetition, so many instructions, but all for a glorious ending to know that the Lord is there. And guess what? This is right around the corner. So if you feel like you're in a season of your life where the Lord is not there, the best thing you can do is trust that He is, even if you can't feel Him, and keep on marching because you're going to get to that place where you land and say, oh, the Lord is here. I knew He was here all along. I may not have felt Him 10 miles back, but He was there indeed. And what's so awesome is that where sin cut us off from the fellowship of God in the Garden of Eden, here in this new Jerusalem, fellowship with Him once again is made permanent. It can never again be taken from the people of Israel. We already have that permanence of the fellowship through Jesus. But here's where we see that it's restored for the people of Israel as well. And of course, it's only restored for those who end up choosing Him, who realize that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, the true King. And so if you missed everything in this book, don't miss the hope that is offered here in the end. You know, that we will one day be with Him forever, that despite our failures, He is faithful. He's ready to forgive. He is ready to restore. There is nothing that we can do We're not good enough even for that. And so we'll continue to worship Him. You know, where we take the eyes off of ourselves and we put them on Him, or we take our mind off of our worries and we put it onto His goodness and onto His kindness and onto His faithfulness. That is what is going to get us to that next step that we need to take that might feel impossible. So let's take a look at some of our deep dive questions. What do these detailed chapters say about the character of God? What does it say about the importance of worship? How can the principles that are laid out in chapter 46 be applied to modern church services? What symbolic role does the prince play in our lives today? How does the old and future sacrificial system relate to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ? Why is it so important to remember? How do you view the symbolism of the river in your spiritual life? And reflect on Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. What does this mean to you? What does it mean for your future? So Jehovah Shammah, thank you for being there. You were there in the beginning. You are with us in the middle, and you are already there in the end. The essence of time spans beyond our limited understanding. There is no end with you, yet you are ever-present. And when we begin to even grasp a tiny bit of this, it blows our minds while you are bringing peace at the same time, knowing that you already hold the future in your hands, so we don't need to worry. We see that even when your people have remained unfaithful through the generations, through thousands of years, you will still stand on that mountain in the end and welcome them home. You will welcome us home. What a beautiful day that will be. So until then, we will find great joy in worshiping you, our King Jesus, knowing that it pleases your heart. We thank you for the reminder that worship isn't about us and our feelings, yet you'll still bless our hearts anyway when we do come with genuine sincerity. So we thank you for that. But we worship you because of all that you have done and because of who you are. The blessing is a byproduct that we are grateful for. So may we never lose sight of your holiness and may our hearts always be reverent before you. 
Oh, how we desire to continue to walk with you in this river of life. We want to be fully immersed in the power of your spirit, moving in step with you in your holiness and in your righteousness. So give us the courage to dive in if we are feeling a little timid or hesitant. Restore that excitement of when we first stepped foot into the water. I pray that those who choose to go deeper into the narrows will only increase. We know the harvest is ripe and the workers are few, but that's not the end of the story. So we will keep pressing to grow deeper with others. May our lives bear fruit year round and may we be agents of healing in others' lives as your spirit works in and through us. And through it all, O oh God, may you receive all the glory. We thank you for giving us a glimpse into the new temple, the new city, and the new era that is yet to come. We are so grateful that we will one day see it and be able to say, hey, I know where we are. He showed this to us. Come with me. I know the way. I know what to do. Wow. What an honor to be one of the chosen ones, God. Thank you. Thank you. I pray that it never be lost on us. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.